Our next speaker, Ian Milne, is well known to us. He's been Director of Global Britain since 1999. He was the founder editor of the European Journal and co-founder of that indispensable publication, Eurofacts. His books include Time to Say No, Alternatives to EU, to EU Membership, 2011, and A Cost Too Far, published in 2004. His business career has been in industry and merchant banking, and today his theme is the economics and mechanics of exit from the European Union and post-exit alternatives for Britain. Thank you, Ian. Thank you, Chairman, and good morning. And sorry I was late, but that's the fault of snow on the line or something down yes. south of London. Uh, what I want to do is, is to really follow on from Daniel and, and paint a picture of what a UK outside the EU might look like um, 5, 10, 15 years from now. And I thought I'd start with a quote from Adam Smith. He said in, in The Wealth of Nations, I quote, the greater part of the apples and even of the onions consumed in Great Britain were in the last century, he meant the, 16th, the 17th century, imported from Flanders. And um, that, that to me, highlights the fact that we have always been a trading nation, and because of geography, much of that trade has been out towards the continent of Europe and back from the continent of Europe. And that, of course, will continue uh, once we leave the EU. Although, as, as we shall see, um, proportionately, the trade with the EU will shrink and the trade with the rest of the world will, will increase. 20 years ago, when I got involved in this, this battle, I used to hear uh, Michael Heseltine saying things like, um, uh, yeah, over two thirds of our trade is with the EU. And I was coming at this, this uh, question absolutely fresh, but it, instinctively, since I'd worked for about uh, 15 years on the continent in two different EU countries. It seemed to me to be a bit exaggerated. So I looked at the figures and I found, of course, that um, Hezo was talking through his hat. He's still talking through his hat. And indeed, when I've uh, listened to on the radio or TV or, or read about it in the press, Roland Rudd and his band of Europhiles uh, talking about trade with the EU. Again, they are quoting figures that um, are not just wrong, but they are incredibly wrong and, and uh, you know, utter distortions of the truth. So what I thought I'd do is, is um, and forgive me if this is a bit simplistic, but, but it, I, you know, the level of ignorance amongst people who should know better, I'm talking about politicians now, about the basic facts of British trade are such that um, it may be helpful if we just do a, a quick seminar on this. So these are British exports in 2011. And as you know, exports comprise goods, services, income, and transfers. <laughs> Goods means every, anything physical from oil, coffee beans, to aero engines, to complicated things and less complicated things. And that accounted th in this year by value for 43% of uh, our global <coughs> exports of goods, uh, of, 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 of all this. Um, services, uh, well, that includes a variety of things. For example, it includes consultancy services, accountancy services provided overseas by a British outfit for which it fee uh, receives fees. Those are, uh, that's what constitutes services. Income, here we have the scenario where a company, a British company, buys a company or sets up a company in, let's say, Venezuela and um, that company 
is operating in Venezuela and elsewhere in South America, and it pays either dividends or interest or management fees back to the UK, and they show up in the UK balance of payments as income. Now, the last one, which only accounts for 2% of uh, the total, is transfers. Uh, this isn't, strictly speaking, trade, but it, that's simply that how it's, uh, it, it figures in the balance of payments data, and it's only 2%, but that includes things like, for example, um, remittances, when it comes to exports, remittances back to the UK by... British people working overseas. Um, in the other direction, when we, when we look at the, the negatives, the import side, transfers, of course, uh, includes our contribution, gross and net contributions to the EU budget. So in that year, the, these, these proportions, by the way, change a bit from time to time. Um, as recently as 2009, the goods uh, weight in our total exports was 39%, and this year it's up to 43%. The 2012 figures, um, full year figures, won't be available until about June or July, and we'll see then how it comes out. So, um, four convenient categories uh, recognized internationally, this, all, all developed countries, and, and most developing countries nowadays, do their trade statistics using this breakdown. Um, and uh, as we'll see later on, this, this can give, give rise, but the internationalization and the harmonization of trade statistics, it can give some distortions. But for the time being, here we are. Um, now, the, there's the, these categories are not rigid. Um, distinct. There's a lot of, when, when you get on the ground, as it were, there are a lot of overlaps between these various things. And one example I uh, often use is that of Rolls-Royce. Rolls-Royce in Derby, as you know, uh, produces aero engines for the world's airliners and, and many of the world's air forces. So let's take the scenario where Rolls-Royce sells, let's say, 12 jet engines to an American airline. Uh, jet engines which are manufactured in Derby and then physically shipped out to North America, to, to the United States. So the, the, um, the money that Rolls receives for those engines figures in the British data as an export of goods. However, Rolls-Royce probably simultaneously has got a five-year, 10-year, 15-year maintenance contract for those engines with the US airline concerned, for which it will receive fees back in Britain. So that stream of fees in respect of maintenance of jet engines, that comes up in services. And also, it's probable that Rolls-Royce naturally has a number of um, uh, service, uh, subsidiaries in the United States, including manufacturing subsidiaries. And it's likely that um, a lot of the um, maintenance um, and consultancy in respect of the, the 12 engines op operating on this US Airlines uh, aeroplanes will be serviced from Rolls-Royce's American subsidiary. And that American subsidiary, with any luck, will be paying, on a regular basis, um, dividends back to the parent company in Derby, Derby, and interest if, for example, the parent company in Britain has made a loan to its subsidiary in the United States, etc. So those, um, that stream of um, revenues arising from the sale of these jet engines uh, also shows up in the, the income category. Fine. The circle represents now the value of all British exports in 2011. 
and that amounted to £700 billion. And what I want to show you here is that um, this bit here are the visible exports, in other words, exports of goods. And let me remind you that includes things like oil, uh, apples, um, and jet engines, anything physical that is produced in this country and then exported. But the invisibles, in other words, exports of services, receipts of income, and a tiny bit of transfers, visibles are much, much bigger than, excuse me, invisibles are much, much bigger than visibles. And in fact, uh, the disproportion here, it's about, th these are about one third bigger than the value of visible exports. This is nothing new. Um, if we were to go back to, say, 1900, uh, I would guess that it might have been that much, but invisible, when the City of London then uh, was the f the genuinely and absolutely the financial centre for the whole world. Um, and even if you go back to uh, the 19th century and the 18th century. I wouldn't be at all surprised if, um, and if it were possible to do a, a comparable uh, analysis, uh, the invisibles bit would again be, be pretty big in relation to the whole of British exports. So what we're talking about then is um, far more, uh, in value terms anyway, far bigger invisibles than visibles. And if we go now to the, I think we go, we go back in some other Yeah, there we go. This you'll be delighted to know is the last chart. <laughs> um, I, I just wanted to know, you know, most politicians anyway, and indeed most people, probably when they utter the words British exports, and, and when listeners listen to them and hear the word British exports, I suppose they tend to associate it with exports of goods, motor cars, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I may be wrong, but I suspect that's, that's the case. And so, I just thought I'd, I'd talk a little bit about um, where British goods exports go. This is 2011, and um, as you can see, the value then, in that year, of British goods exports going to the EU itself was slightly bigger than the value going to the rest of the world. However, for the first time, I think, in 2012, um, the rest of the world, goods exports, value of goods exports from Britain, exceeded that value there, going to the EU. And so what we're looking at now, uh, and, and Daniel alluded to it, we're looking at a situation where um, that bit is going to proportionate, at least, increase, and the EU bit is going to diminish. All of these figures that I've, and percentages that I've shown here and quoted <coughs> to you, um, they are based on the official statistics. The official statistics, I'm afraid, are wrong. Uh, <laughs> And they're wrong because of two um, st distortions to the uh, trade statistics. And some of you may be familiar with them. There's one distortion which um, concerns mainly goods, and there's another distortion which is probably even uh, more distortionary, and that refers to invisibles. Now, the, what, the one referring to goods is 
something I baptized years ago, the Rotterdam Antwerp effect. And to my amazement, this, this phrase has now been picked up by statistical bodies, um, not just in Britain, but also in other countries. And Rotterdam and Antwerp, as, as you probably know, Antwerp's in Belgium, Rotterdam is not far over the border in Holland. They are the two biggest ports measured by through traffic, not just in Europe, but probably in the world. Well, no, no, probably they're behind Singapore now, maybe Shanghai, maybe Hong Kong, but they're, they're still pretty big. And the distortion in, let's restrict it now to the British state's trade statistics, arises because when physical goods uh, are shipped through uh, Antwerp in Belgium and Rotterdam in Holland, only some of them stay in Holland and Belgium. Uh, we don't know how much uh, goes onwards to other EU countries, um, but it's quite a lot. And we don't know really how much goes into, say, Antwerp on a container ship, and the container is then simply taken off that ship, plonked onto another container ship, which is on its way to Singapore. We just don't know. And the statistical authorities claim not to know either. But over the years, we've, we've done um, a number of uh, simulations by just making assumptions about... Uh, what the distortion might be. And it, it is clear, I think, that um, the, if we if, remember on, on the previous uh, chart, uh, where 43%, no, sorry, I'm, I'm confusing the numbers, about 43% uh, officially in 2011 of our global exports went to the EU. Uh, yes, went to the EU. Um, I am assuming, and I think it's a pretty reasonable assumption, that that 43%, once you take account of the distortions, is only about 40%, which means that 60% is going outside the EU, and that means that our trade outside, or exports outside the EU, are already, already 50% higher by value than our, our exports to the EU. I, I, I've jumped a bit. I, meant to me I want to mention also the, the other distortion affecting invisibles. Uh, this is called the, um, confusingly, and I apologize for that, but I call it the Netherlands distortion. This arises when, let's say, let, let's take the example of Rolls-Royce again. Rolls-Royce decides that it wants to buy a, an existing company let's say, in Japan. Um, so Rolls-Royce consults its tax department and its tax advisors, and they say, OK, you want to transfer £30 million from Derby to Tokyo. Uh, we suggest that you um, create a brass plate sh shell company in Holland that you transfer the 30 million pounds to the Dutch company, and then the Dutch company uh, transfers that amount on to Tokyo. Um, the Dutch company, brass plate, no employees. It is literally a brass plate on a building in um, Rotterdam or somewhere, or Amsterdam. Um, the problem is that in the official statistics, the, the, the capital outflow, the 30 million pounds going from Rolls-Royce through Holland to Tokyo, where there's an actual manufacturing company, and the dividends and possibly interest that the Japanese company remits to uh, Derby flows backwards through that brass plate company. And what that means, by the way, in practice, it's, it's, probably, it's much more complicated because usually there's not just the Dutch brass plate company. There's another one in Luxembourg. Uh, I'm always amused how um, uh, 
Luxembourg Finance Minister's lecture the rest of the, of the EU about um, uh, probity and, and uh, clarity and all the rest of it. Uh, I mean, they talk about Cyprus being a, um, <laughs> a haven for dodgy funds, but I, I bet Lux Luxembourg is well up there in the league table of dodgy jurisdictions. Now, wh what does this mean for um, the trade statistics which relate to flows of interest and um, dividends? What it means is that, and by the way, you can see this distortion operating not just in the British figures, but also in the US figures, the French figures, the German figures, etc. What the Netherlands distortion does is that it makes it appear that, um, I'll, I'll start again and make it hopefully a little bit easier. When, when um, the, the flows, let, let, let's talk, let's just take now, for example, the, the dividends and interest flowing back from the Japanese manufacturing company to Derby. When the money is transferred back, um, it, it shows up in the British trade statistics as a receipt of income, not from Japan, but from Holland, because that's where the um, nearest or initial um, bra brass plate company is, is uh, located. So if you look at, uh, as I do occasionally, look at the um, geographical breakdown of <coughs> income flows um, on the receipt side, but it's, it operates also on the, the payment side, um, they make it look as if the EU is a huge source, relatively speaking, of income for British companies, when in fact um, a lot of that income is coming from outside the EU. Um, any questions there? I, I know this is, can be a, a, a mind-numbingly complicated thing. Can you explain thing. very simply yeah. why any British company should do this and why the tax people think there is an advantage? Because if a lot are doing it, this is a very powerful argument indeed for use in a referendum campaign. Well, uh, people are doing it simply because, um, for, uh, take, just taking this, this narrow uh, example of a Dutch brass plate company, um, <laughs> There is no income tax or a capital gains tax, from a Dutch point of view, on the flows of capital and income transiting through that company. Whereas if the, uh, say the, say the Rolls-Royce, to take the example again, if Rolls-Royce had invested directly into the Japanese subsidiary, then there would have been taxes, Japanese taxes um, on the flows of income coming back from it. That, that's the... That's why people do this. They don't do it for fun. It, it's simply to avoid paying tax. It's extremely common, too. Oh, I it's incredibly common. It's yes. incredibly common. Yes, yes. Yeah. And by the way, um, although we, we have been to see the British statistical authorities, which, as you probably know, it's the Office for National Statistics, the ONS, and make representations to them and say, look, we understand that you, the statistical authority, are bound by international agreements to harmonize your compilation of statistics with those of other countries around the world. That's fine. So they're stuck with these distortions. But why don't you publish a guesstimate in the appendices to, to, make, to let people um, be aware of what the, the real underlying economic significance of all these flows is. And they, they um, uh, by the way, the other thing we said to them, we said to them, look, they said, oh, it's very difficult, we can't do that, you know, we don't know how much is going to Rotterdam and staying in the EU, how much is going to. We said to them, um, we, this was Nigel Vincent, Malcolm Pearson and me, said to them, well, look, why don't you send a couple of your guys over to Rotterdam and, and um, ask them to spend half a day with the, the port manager in Rotterdam? And the same in, in uh, Antwerp, you know. We bet that they could tell you, yeah. roughly, 
how much was staying in Rotterdam and how uh, in Holland and how much was going on, you know, to Timbuktu. So again, they go, well, you know, we've got budget requirements. Uh, so, so. <laughs> However, the good news is, the good news is, I, I found um, uh, this information not, not in respect of British statistics, but I found in the French pounds of payments of all places, which is produced in France by the Banque de France, they picked up on these statistical distortions. And as they say in the balance of payments, you know, these official figures don't give a true picture of where French business is investing overseas and in the other direction. And so <coughs> what the Banque de France did, it sent a questionnaire to all 40 companies in the, the CAC 40, um, that's the equivalent of our FTSE 100. And they said to them, um, it was a very complicated questionnaire. No, I didn't see a copy, but it must have been. And it's, what it said to them was, look, we appreciate that for tax reasons, you have to channel your investments and your receipts of income, dividends, interest, etc. You, you have to do to um, use um, dodgy jurisdictions like Holland and Luxembourg, etc. But tell us where the underlying economic flows to and from France are coming from. And the Banque de France uh, publishes that. And of course, the, the, the picture there of the spread of French economic activity, or corporate activity, worldwide through FDI, foreign direct investment, is quite different from that which you, you get by simply looking at the official figures. Well, look, that's enough on the um, the nuts and bolts of trade statistics. I, I know it's terribly tedious, but, but um, if you learn about this or, and, and you are campaigning, you can often trip up politicians and cam Eurofile ca uh, campaigners who are talking through their hats about uh, uh, the figures. I, I want now just to pick up on, on what Daniel was saying and talk about the next 5, 10 or 20 years. Yes, the, 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 the Eurozone now, let's take the Eurozone for the sake of simplicity, because once Britain leaves, and assuming the Eurozone is still a 70-member Eurozone, um, then the Eurozone will represent about 90% of the GDP of EU26, i.e. EU minus uh, the UK. And the Eurozone, uh, in, a, in a very, very few years' time, um, probably by the time of, of this referendum, uh, will be down to about 16% of world GDP. And as you may know, Tim Congdon has done some various, very interesting projections, uh, suggesting that by 2050, which is after all only 40 years, uh, a little over 40 years away, do I mean that, or 30 years away? 30, 35. Um, Eurozone GDP as a proportion of world GDP will be down to 5%. Um, so, you know, the, 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 the slope is, is downwards. Um, and th that, that means that not just for Britain, and I'm sure Germans have done the, done the maths as well, and I'm sure the French have done the maths as well, Every significant industrial nation in the current European Union is going to have to look for its prosperity to the wider world outside. Um, so, so let's imagine, by, by, by say, 2025, which is only, what is it, uh, 13 years from now, or 12 years from now, uh, the Eurozone might only account for 14% of world GDP, and this is barring any um, prolonged collapse uh, within the Eurozone, and, and as we've seen in, in Cyprus uh, just the last few days, um, that is not unthinkable. However, so it, by, by 2025, let's assume the, Euro, the EU26 or Eurozone is going to be down to around 
um, 12 or 13 percent of, of GDP. So we in Britain have got to be able to export successfully to the 88 percent of the world in terms of GDP anyway, where with any luck there will be growth and not just gentle growth as we're accustomed to in our part of the world, but um, really healthy, healthy growth. And we can see now that this is happening already because uh, this segment here, goods to the rest of the world and indeed um, visible to the rest of the world, that is expanding already. It's already bigger than that and that presumably will of the things we need to continue. Question mark, can we uh, make the most of all that uh, potential growth outside the EU um, while we're still in the EU? Well, of course we can. We're already doing it. But uh, the burdens on the UK economy um, as well as the um, utterly incomprehensible policies of the coalition. I'm thinking of uh, the foreign aid budget. I looked at the appendices in the budget uh, two days ago and see that, um, yeah, nothing much is, is, um, is actually being cut, but um, foreign aid, it's going like that. Uh, so that, that's just, just one thing. But, you know, outside the EU, obviously, progressively, it wouldn't happen instantaneously, but pro progressively, the British economy would, would, would throw off um, a very, very significant burden on the economy. If you just take, for example, um, the, the uh, yes, the, 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 just the simple gross contribution to the EU budget, it was 19 billion in Canada year 2011, and no doubt in 2012 it, it will have been over um, 20 billion. Uh, that, in anybody's money, is a very, very significant figure. Um, and actually, funny enough, that's the one thing that would uh, finish um, quite rapidly once we left the EU. And that money could be de deployed on, on other things. Um, so, there's a lot to, to uh, play for uh, in terms of the prosperity of the British domestic economy. Uh, if one were to leave the EU, we'd throw off that burden and we'd throw off the regulatory burdens, which or ma many of the regulatory burdens, which are <coughs> very, very difficult to measure. But uh, lots of studies, lots of serious, serious studies done by people in this room, amongst other people, um, have shown that these burdens are very, very heavy in terms of percentages of GDP. Um, you know, there have been a number of serious cost-benefit analyses done in the last 10 years of the cost of British membership. Not a single one, and by the way, uh, including a lot done by people outside the EU, not a single one has concluded that there is a net benefit from being in the EU financially. Um, most of them include that the, uh, or all of them conclude that the net cost of EU membership is significant. And in the last five years, most studies have come up with um, a figure between 5% and 10% of GDP per year. And some uh, studies, um, in, including mine in 2004 in, in A Cost Too Far, um, and Patrick Minford's study in the same year of 2005, we, both of us, utterly independently, I should say, uh, sketched in scenarios which suggested that the annual net cost of EU membership for the United Kingdom 
could be over 20%. Both he and I were, were staggered when, when these numbers dropped <coughs> out of the analysis. And, and we, we, both of them, you know, heavily qualified them and said, look, we, these depend on projections, etc., etc. et cetera. Nothing is certain as well. But there we are. That's what they came up with. And to our amazement, uh, I, I think it was in 2005 or 2006, the then Chancellor, one Gordon Brown, um, came up with, uh, he published, or the Treasury published, a study under his name, um, where he, by the way, a very, very shoddy piece of work. It wasn't economic analysis, it was naturally propaganda. But it, it um, uh, suggests, it, it, it quoted various figures, you know, barriers to uh, transatlantic trade, you know, X percent, um, too much regulation, Y percent, et cetera, et cetera. He didn't say anywhere in the document that there was probably overlap between these various uh, bits of uh, cost to the UK economy. And if you add it up with all his, his various things, uh, it came up to 28% of um, uh, UK GDP per year. Too much, perhaps, perhaps. Um, you know, w when we wrote about that, we simply said, well, look, Let's be fair to Gordon Brown for once, and let's divide his 28% by four, and that comes out at 7% of GDP, and that is still a pretty, pretty substantial figure. Well, look, it'll, I'll stop there, but very happy to take any questions uh, or criticism.